Well, hi there. David Chadwick here at Tactics Studios. Welcome back. You're uh, now on the second half of our six uh, video series of tutorials associated with using the default game engine in the building of a tower defense game. You know, as I think about this, uh, tower defense is a pretty popular genre, and I'm sure a lot of you are looking at this because you want to learn how to really build that particular style of game. But, you know, I think more importantly, as I think through the types of things we're walking through on these tutorials, you're going to find that the techniques and the design parameters that we're applying to this particular tutorial is really applicable to a whole host of different types of games. And I'm hoping that as you walk through this, that you can see and can map this technique really applies for whether it's a bubble shooter or it's an asteroids game or whatever the case may be that you're thinking about developing. In this fourth tutorial, we're going to focus on fire exchange. You can't really have a tower defense game unless the tanks are firing on the towers and the towers are firing on the tanks. So uh, we're really going to delve into that in some detail. And I hope you find it very helpful and very interesting. Let's go ahead and jump in. So real quick, uh, let's benchmark where we are on the roadmap. Uh, as you see uh, here, uh, we've already done the opening splash screens and the level selection menu in uh, tutorial one. In tutorial two, we spawned multiple different types of tanks, different characteristics, have predefined paths for them across each of the different style map sheets uh, so they can move at a constant speed. Uh, we now have a, a, a tower a resource box where we spawn different types of towers. Uh, we have a drag and drop operation to move them to the defensive positions. And now we're really ready to look at that fire exchange technique uh, where we have the ability for the towers and the tanks to fire at each other. We're pointing the turrets uh, towards those targets, uh, spawning bullets, uh, having the bullet follow a trajectory, and then having an explosion if it hits, hits its target. So uh, with that, uh, we're now really ready to begin. Okay, always good to see the end first. Let's take a quick snippet and see what this is going to look like when we're done with this tutorial. As you see, uh, we now have fire exchange between both the tanks and the towers. Uh, when they become within effective range, you can't have an in infinite range. So when they come within the effective range, uh, they uh, spawn a series of bullets. Those bullets follow a trajectory from the shooter to the target. Uh, when the bullet hits the target, there's an explosion effect. Um, and then uh, as they hit that target, the strength points of that target decline, again, by the amount that's associated with the strength of the shooter. When the strength of that target uh, declines to zero, then it's destroyed, there's a larger explosion effect, and then the game object is removed from the game. All right, so uh, before we get too entrenched in the details of how our Build 4 project has been extended from what it was back in tutorial number three, let's spend a moment and walk through what I call an event timeline of all the actions that occur between tanks and towers as they engage each other. So when a range collision object of a tower collides with the tank collision object of a tank, the tower rotates towards the tank and starts firing bullets at the tank. And as each bullet is spawned, three things occur. An angle toward the target tank needs to be computed. The X and Y speeds need to be determined, which will equate to a constant linear speed for that bullet type. And three, the bullet needs to be rotated so that the image is appropriately oriented to the trajectory. When a bullet's collision object collides with a tank collision object, the bullet script was going to send a message to the tank reflecting a, quote, bullet strike. Also, an explosion game object is spawned at the location of the bullet strike. When a tank receives the bullet strike message, it decrements its strength by whatever the strength of that particular type bullet was, and it updates the strength indicator bar accordingly, maybe three bars down to two or something such as that. Also, because of the time differential between firing the bullet and the bullet actually hitting the tank, that, that tank might be engaged by multiple towers at the same time, so we need to perform a check to make sure that that firing tower is still active. 
each frame, the strength of all units is checked. Because once the strength of a unit is down to zero, two actions occur. A, quote, target destroyed message is sent to the tower that's firing. And that tower is then made available to engage other targets of any or with its, within its range. And the tank is destroyed. Well, now that we've seen what the sequence of events is, as we include tank tower interaction, how is that reflected within this completed build forward to fold project? Let's first look at explosions. We can see that the explosions are included using a quote, a game object prototype with both a sprite and a script where the script initiates the explosion animation group, as well as deleting the explosion game object once that animation is complete. And it also includes a factory within the main collection that allows us to spawn explosions. The explosions are spawned out of the enemy tank action script for tank hits and the tower action script for tower hits as part of the message processing related to the message bullet strike. And so what about bullets? Again, the completed project uses a prototype with both a collision object and a sprite that also includes a script component. The script is used to A, change the sprite to match the bullet type, B, set the rotation applied to the bullet to match the calculated trajectory, C, it updates the bullet position every frame along that trajectory, and D, it deletes the bullet upon the bullet striking the target, either a tank or a tower, whichever it was aimed at. Also, there's a factory within the main dot collection associated with this bullet prototype. The bullets are spawned out of the enemy tank action or tower action scripts, depending upon what the firing unit was. And that script performs uh, several actions. Uh, first, it computes the angle and the speed for the bullet while aiming at the designated target. Secondly, it updates the strength indicator upon receipt of a bullet strike message. Third, it processes a destroy function by spawning an explosion and deleting the tank or tower game object. And finally, it processes a target destroyed message by stopping the firing of bullets and resetting the target. So now that we've got a better understanding of the event profile, that event timeline, as well as the general approach we want to take for both bullets and explosions, very quickly, let's see exactly what's in our changed asset list, and that'll give us basically a to-do, a VTOC, for a deeper review. First, new assets. We can see that there's a new prototype. There's the bullet prototype uh, game object. And then there's also three prototypes for the three different explosion types. Let's look at main collection. Within the main collection, we have a create bullet, which is a container for the factory associated with a bullet prototype. And similarly, we have create explosion one, create explosion two, and create explosion three, which are each containers for factories associated with explosions type one, two, and three. You know, as you might expect, there's gonna be a new script as a component to the bullet prototype but we're also gonna have some minor changes within the controller constrained to the text shown in the help screen pop-up. Also, the new explosion prototype has an associated explosion script. And the scripts for both the enemy tank actions as well as the tower actions is gonna reflect the logic that we described in our event timeline here just a minute ago. So hey, time's a wasting. Let's jump in. As we've said a thousand times, can't go without a plan. Uh, this plan is very straightforward. It's just going to go stepwise through each of the features associated with this particular build. Uh, we're first going to add the explosion effects, both the explosion associated with being hit by a bullet, as well as when either the tank or the tower is fully destroyed. Uh, then we're going to add the spawning of the bullet uh, game object and the, the, the movement of that the bullet along a predefined trajectory from firing unit to target unit. Uh, then we're going to look at enemy tank actions. That's the rotation of the turret to face uh, its uh, target tower, as well as um, the decrementing of the strength points as it's hit by uh, bullets. Then we're going to do the same thing for the towers and the tower action, basically looking at the script to apply the rotation and the spawning of bullets and the decrementing of strength points. 
And then we're going to wrap it up really with kind of a, a beginning point for the next tutorial. We're going to add an additional GUI node associated with the tower cost. Uh, that way we have the ability to acquire using resource points towers. And this just seemed like a logical place to put that. You know, as I've mentioned before, down here in the comments, uh, you'll see there's a shared uh, Google Drive. I really urge you to go ahead and download the zip file. That's got this full tutorial number four project file, all the images, all the source code, uh, the fold to fold project. And I encourage you to do that so that you can follow along or work independently and tweak it as you deem. All right, enough lead up. My goodness, let's jump in the trench and start building this thing. Okay, first up, explosions. Uh, we have three things we really want to talk about here. First, we're going to build the prototype for the explosion. And then within a container game object, uh, we're going to have a factory that allows us to spawn those explosions using the, uh, the prototype. And then lastly, we're going to have a script associated with that explosion, and we're going to walk through that. Let's open up our project that we want to do our walkthrough on inside the default game engine. Uh, build 4, uh, and if we open it up, uh, we can see that there are three distinct uh, game object prototypes for three different types of explosions. Explosion 1, 2, and 3. And please note that uh, the differences between these is the, simply the animation group that's identified and the script. Uh, I, I especially designed it this way, primarily so it's more easy to keep future enhancements that are going to be unique to each type of explosion segregated. So I've done that basically as a placeholder for future enhancements. Let's open up explosion number one because we're going to see the other two are very, very similar. In, in explosion one prototype, it consists of a script, in this case explosion one, and it consists of a sprite. As we can see, the sprite is uh, the Explosion 1 animation group, which was extracted from the uh, Anim Assets 1 Atlas. Similarly, Explosion 2 is linked to the Explosion 2 script and the Explosion, uh, excuse me, Explosion 2 animation group. And the same same applies for Explosion number 3. Looking at the Lua code within Explosion 1.script, <laughs> not much there. That's a good thing, right? Uh, the init function uses the play animation message and that'll change the animation group to explosion one. And that way the explosion animation will start immediately upon this explosion game object being spawned. With an on message, that processes the animation done message, which is sent by the default game engine as soon as that full multi-image explosion animation is completed. Yep, you guessed it. Explosion two and explosion three scripts are essentially the same, except that they direct the explosion two or the explosion three animation groups. Okay, hey, in this second segment, we're going to focus on the bullet. We're going to have a bullet prototype. Uh, that prototype is going to consist of a collision object. It's going to have a sprite, and it's going to have a script associated with it. We're going to walk through all three. So moving on to the uh, bullet prototype, let's again, let's take a look at our assets. We do have a bullet prototype game object. And if we open it up and look at it inside the, uh, the outline window, we can see the components. There's a collision object, which is of trigger type, and it filters collision using the group of bullet, and it applies that to uh, any one of a number of different masks, the enemy objective, a tank body, or a tower body, depending upon who the shooter is. And we'll note that the uh, collision object is a sphere, the shape is a sphere with a diameter of 10 pixels. We have a sprite that invokes the tank one bullet as its default animation, and that's out of the graphic assets atlas. And as you'll see, the animation is actually set and reset dynamically within our script. Now, taking a look at the uh, bullet action script, well, the bullet action script has a little bit more meat to it than the script we just walked through associated with the explosion, doesn't it? But it's still relatively simple. Let's take it piece by piece. Let's first talk about overall initialization. There are a set of script properties initialized at the beginning of the script. As we uh, all remember, script properties by their very nature are unique to each and every instance of the game object that was spawned. So this would enable us to have a different angle or speed or a target, etc., for each bullet that's being fired. 
There's two local variables that are declared. They reflect one, the speed of the bullet, and that's in a table by bullet type, and the strength of the bullet, again in a table by bullet type. Let's look at initialization within the init function. Uh, again, we use the play animation message that's used to set the group animation to a single image associated with the self bullet type. And the bullet rotation is computed so that the image is aligned with the angle that the bullet will be traversing using essentially the same logic that we described in a previous tutorial when we were talking about the rotation of a tank or a tower body. Also, the X and Y speeds of the bullet are geometrically calculated so that the linear speed remains constant, regardless of the angle. Let's move on to on message. There's really only one message pattern being processed here, and that's when there's a collision response with either a tower body or a tank body. When that occurs, four things occur. The bullet game object is deleted. A message is sent to the other ID, aka the tank or the tower that the bullet just hit, sending a bullet strike message. And an explosion animation is spawned at the location of the bullet strike. Lastly, in the update process, each frame, the bullet position is updated along its trajectory. Okay, now we're ready to start looking at the tank and uh, how the uh, script needs to be modified to support uh, the firing of bullets and the decrementing of the strength points associated with uh, being hit by a bullet. Okay, here we are in the third segment. We're going to take a quick look using diff now at the overall manner in which the enemy tank action script's been extended to support the spawning of bullets, as well as tracking conditions while it's within the range of a tower. Okay, we've made a, a minor update to the functions in the uh, header comments. We have two new local functions, a fire bullet and destroy tank. Uh, within the init, we have a new script property associated with the delay between bullets. And then within on message, we have a couple new message IDs that are processed, target destroyed and bullet strike. And lastly, uh, when the tank has been taking fire uh, within the effective range, uh, we have a trigger response with the tank body. Lastly, within the update process, uh, we check to see if the tank has been destroyed. Well, now that we've identified the scope of changes to the enemy tank action script, let's go ahead back into our code editor and take a, a little deeper look into each of those extensions and how they've been implemented. Let's first take a look at the uh, declarations. There were uh, two local new functions that were added. The first local function added was a uh, fire bullet. There's an important condition being applied here. It checks that the firing status is true, but also that the target remains an active game object within the game. You know, given the trajectory time for a bullet and the fact that we have multiple tanks potentially shooting at the same tower, it's possible this function would be called after the tower has already been deleted. So if the tower is still active, the following logic applies. First, it obtains the current tank position as well as the current position of the designated target for that tank. It calculates an offset so that the bullet is spawned at the end of the turret, not at the center of the tank body. And then the function spawns a bullet passing several parameters to the bullet factory. It passes the bullet type, the bullet angle, and the target location. A second local function has been defined as well, destroy tank. It's called once a tank's strength depletes to zero. When that occurs, the function spawns an explosion at the location of the tank. And then using a timer, it waits destroy delay, a quarter of a second in this case, uh, prior to sending a message to the controller directing that the entire tank collection be deleted. And it passes the tank ID as a parameter so a controller knows which one to delete. Within our initialization, within init, there's a bullet delay script property declared. That's the time and seconds between individual bullet firings. Within on message, there are a couple new message IDs that are being processed in this uh, build four. 
The first is target destroyed. That cancels a timer, which is being used to continue to fire bullets on a repeat cycle. That way a destroyed t tank obviously can't continue firing. And it sets the status script property, self-firing status, to false, aka the tank is now not firing at anything. The self-targets reset to the enemy objective, and that's the building with a flag on the top of it. You'll notice that there's an extension applied to processing the entering of a tower into the tank's effective range. When the message enter is true, it sets self-firing status to true, and after a short delay, it calls the fire bullet function, which starts the bullet spawning at this target. Upon message enter becoming false, however, that's when the tower is no longer within the range of the tank, it cancels the bullet spawning repeat time, and it sets the firing status back to false. Another new message ID in this particular build is bullet strike. Here, consistent with the logic we've walked through during the exchange event timeline, the strength of the bullet is subtracted from this tank's strength, and the strength bar image is modified to reflect that new change in strength points. We're using the play.animation feature to accomplish that. And then the last new message being processed is trigger response, while the other group is the tower range. This reflects the situation when a tank is taking fire from a tower, which is now within the tower's effective range. For this condition, it essentially sets the script property self.towerfiring to that tower's ID. Now let's take a look at our update process. We've added a final check. Each frame, the script checks to see if the tank has been destroyed. That means that its strength is less than or equal to zero. And when that condition applies, if the tower firing at it is active, it sends a message indicating that the tank is destroyed. Now that way, the tower that's been firing and destroyed this tank can now redirect its fires onto different tanks. And then it also calls the destroy tank function, which we reviewed just a few moments ago. Okay, hey, that wraps up the changes to the enemy tank action script. Now it's time to move on to our tower actions, and you're going to see that that echoes many of the exact same changes we've just made here, since the bullet firing logic is pretty consistent between the two different types of firing units. Okay, and moving on to our towers, there's really two things I really want to focus on here. First is we're going to have a label applied to each tower that depicts the tower cost. That's going to be shown when it's down in the resources box, and then it's going to be hidden as you deploy your tower to a defensive position. And then we're going to go into the uh, tower action script, and we're going to apply the changes necessary for the spawning of bullets in order to fire. And when there's a bullet strike, the impact of that bullet and the decrementing of the strength points. Well, before we jump into the tower action script, we actually have a new component that we want to add to the tower collection prototypes. When a tower collection is in the tower asset staging area in that bottom left hand corner of the game screen, we want to display the tower cost associated with deploying that tower to one of the defensive positions on the map sheet. So here's an easy way to do that. Let's go ahead and open up the Tower 1 parent. And opening up the tower one parent collection within the outline window, we see that under parent tower, we have a second label component, tower cost. We'll use this label as the means for showing the cost when in the tower asset box and disable it once the tower is deployed. So within the properties window, there's several major parameters. It's located at an X of zero and a Y of minus 38 in relationship to that parent tower. And we've scaled it to 0.4 so that it's an appropriate size given, given what we want the screen to look like. I've placed some dummy text in it that we're going to set dynamically within our script file. It's black and it uses the Call of Duty font and a center pivot. Okay, hey, please note that the same logic equally applies to the Tower 2 parent and the Tower 3 parent collection prototypes. All right, so let's go ahead and start now by comparing our version 3 tower actions uh, against the tower actions associated with this current build, build number 4. 
So as always, we edit our uh, header comments to track the major extensions that we've made. No surprises there. Um, as you can see, there is a new script property, tank firing, and that will capture the ID of the tank that's actually firing at this particular tower. You can see I've cleared up the comment here to qualify that it's in quinturnians for the tower angle. We have a couple new local functions. Uh, we have fire bullet, and we'll get into the details of that here in a moment, as well as uh, destroy tower. There are a number of uh, new uh, script properties here that are initialized uh, during the init function. Everything from a starting position to uh, a uh, angle to bullet delays to the initial target for the aiming point, firing status, things such as that. Within the update sequence, uh, we are going to perform a check as to whether the tower still has any strength points left and then perform certain functions associated with that. And then lastly, there's a couple new message IDs within on message. There's a process for when the tower is taking fire from a tank that's within its effective range. Uh, there's a strike of a bullet. So uh, that gives you a quick summary of uh, what we're going to go through here. Let's go ahead now into those details. So now let's move on to our tower action script. Uh, you may encounter some deja vu here as I walk through the changes that have been made. That's because there's a lot of commonality between how a tower is spawning a bullet and how we saw that the tank does exactly the same thing. Yes, I know. There's a really strong opportunity here to extract some of that commonality and develop some uh, shared functions. Uh, I'll leave that to you. Sorry. Okay. Uh, let's first get into initialization. Very similar to what we saw in our uh, tank script. Uh, within tower action script, there's a local function, fire bullet. You've seen this before, and the same logic is going to apply. When the firing status is true and the target remains an active game object within the game, it obtains the current tower position as well as the current position of the designated target for that tower. It calculates a turret offset, spawns a bullet. The tower action script also has a destroy function where it gets the tower gets destroyed. That's called once a tower's strength depletes to zero, and then using a timer, prior to sending a message to the controller directing that this tower be deleted. So there's three new script properties that are declared, similar to what we saw for tank bullets. There's the bullet delay, which is a table of bullet firing delays, one for each type. There's a simple bullet counter. And then there's self.target, which is set to the aiming point. And just remember, aiming point is 10,000 pixels to the top of the screen. So it has the towers pointing straight up. And that'll be the target for all towers when they're not firing at a tank. Next, we're going to initialize the label, the tower cost label that we just established here at the beginning of this segment by setting it to the tower cost that we find for that particular type tower. Next change will be within the update process. Again, each frame, the script is going to check to see if the tower has been destroyed, aka the self-strength is less than or equal to zero. And when that condition applies, if the tank firing at it is active, it sends a message indicating that this tower has been destroyed, and that way the tank can redirect its fires onto a different tower. It calls destroy tower, which we reviewed just a few moments ago, and then an explosion animation is spawned at the location of the destroyed tower. Okay, let's look at the changes in message processing. The first is uh, in addition to when the message ID is dragging tower. Now we've added the fact that when that message is received, the script is going to add a disabling of the tower cost label. That would result in the cost disappearing once the player starts dragging a tower out of the tower assets box. Several new message IDs are also added in this version. Firing tank deleted. That resets the tank firing to the enemy objective if the tower is now deployed. When a tower is taking fire from a tank within that tank's effective range, the script property self.tank firing is now set to the tank ID.
When a tank is within the effective range of the tower, when it enters, aka message enter is true, it, it sets the firing status to true, and using a timer, it starts spawning bullets. When the tank exits the effective range of the tower, aka message enter would be false, the bullet timer is canceled and the firing status is set to false. Very similar to what we did with our tanks, the bullet strike message ID is received. We're going to decrement the tower strength by the strength of that bullet, and then we're going to update the strength indicator bar. Okay, uh, let's go ahead and start our wrap up here of uh, tutorial number four uh, with really segment five in which we're going to do three things. Uh, I've got two scripts that I, uh, I really want to walk through because we have extended what we did in our third tutorial, build three, into what we've done here in build four. That would be our controller script as well as the main menu GUI script. So we'll go ahead and do our diff now comparison to compare version three to four, what the major changes were, and then we'll do a deep dive in the code editor into each of those. And then lastly, when we finish that, I want to take a look at what the tutorials looks like and what were the major lessons or major design mechanics that we really emphasized in this particular video. Let's go ahead. Okay, and in order to wrap up this build, uh, we do need to have a couple minor changes to our controller script. Let's go through those really quickly right now. So let's go ahead and take a look at the controller script. Uh, we're going to do a diff now comparing version 4 for the build 4 back to build 3. I have to tell you, I think this is the smallest level of change we've found so far. That's a really good thing. Uh, we just updated our header comments. We changed our global variable version to reflect that it's build 4 instead of build 3. No changes, no changes. And we updated the text within our pop-up menu to reflect the key functions associated with this build. That's it. Those are the only changes. To complete the script walkthroughs for this build number four, let's go ahead and take a look at how the fire exchange affects the main menu graphic user interface. Okay, I'm guilty. I'm going to take a shortcut. There's only a few changes being made to this main menu GUI script. So we're going to walk through them now just using the diff now tool. Uh, that'll show us the unique changes since the previous build, build three. Um, I really don't think it's necessary to jump into the code editor to elaborate on them. They're all pretty self-evident. So uh, the first change is that, as you see here, both the tower asset box and the level banner nodes are going to be disabled when the level selection panel is reset. That means you really don't want to see either the tower uh, resources or the level banner when the menu for selecting which level you're going to play is being displayed. We want to disable them, get them out of the way. Then the callback function at the end of the animation of fade out banner, uh, we really now want to send a message back to the controller telling the controller that that fade out is complete. So we're going to send an end of level banner complete message back there. All right, we're almost wrapped up here with tutorial number four. Let's highlight a couple of the design features that have really been emphasized in this particular tutorial. The first is the use of two different types of collision objects within our towers and within our tank game objects. We've got one collision object associated with range that allows you to monitor whether you're in an effective range of a potential target. The second is a body collision object that's really used to detect the, the, the trajectory and the pinging of a bullet against the body of the tank or against the body of a tower. Uh, the second is really a re-emphasis. Uh, I really like the use of game object prototypes um, and then the use of a factory that allows us to spawn multiple instances of each of those individual prototypes, whether it be a tank, whether it be a tower, whether it be a bullet. Um, and that's a pretty important concept. And integral to that is the collection of the IDs as those are spawned. So you have a control mechanism for deleting them when you're done uh, so that you don't have a memory leakage problem, things such as that. We've had several good examples of how we pass parameters from one script to another script. We're passing a parameters in the spawning of those towers or tanks. 
uh, and that's a pretty important technique. Uh, we've used timers in a number of instances. Uh, it controls how frequently bullets are spawned as one's firing at another, things such as that, or a delay action between the explosion and the deletion of a, of a tank object or the deletion of a tower object. And lastly, the application of a label, the tower cost label, that we're going to be using in our future tutorials. Okay, another one in the box, tutorial number four. I think we've got it done. Uh, just a qu couple quick uh, comments just to wrap this up. I appreciate your feedback and your comments. And in particular, I want to make sure that the, the, uh, the level of detail that we're walking through is appropriate. Um, we all come from different backgrounds, but I really want to make sure that we're not uh, oversimplifying things for you too much. Or by the same token, I don't want to provide so much gory detail that it's becoming redundant. So uh, any feedback you can provide me on that would be really, really helpful, particularly in this new style where we're really taking a completed build and then we're doing a deep dive into it, vice building it from the bottom up. Um, as I've said before, there's a shared Google Drive below. I really strongly urge that you download that zip file open up the project. You know, it's one thing to listen to me drone on. I think it's very important that you do it yourself, that you take a look at the components, take a look at those script files, tweak them a little bit, just to make sure you fully understand each of the individual features that, in fact, I just reviewed. Um, so what's in store for the next tutorial? It's not really a realistic game if you have unlimited resources and you can have as many towers as you want that are as powerful as you want. So we're going to apply, uh, I call it scoring, but we're going to apply some constraints. We're going to have a limited number of uh, resources available to you. Towers are now going to come at a price. You have to expend your resources to get towers, but you also have the ability to repair towers that have been hit by bullets or to upgrade towers from type 1 to type 2 or type 2 to type 3. Uh, we're going to have health points. Uh, every time a tank reaches its objective successfully, your health is going to decrease. And when your health hits zero, you've lost that particular round. So I think you're going to find this really, really wraps up kind of all the various types of features that you would find in a, a typical tower defense game. So tutorial number five is really kind of the end of that. Tutorial number six is going to be some fine tuning uh, just mostly to round off some of the rough edges and to balance the game a little bit. So uh, I hope, again, you're finding it helpful. Comments, please. I appreciate that. And looking forward to seeing you next time. Take care now.